Asheville Free Media, AshevilleFM.org. This is The Final Straw, and I'm Verso Goodness. The show can also be heard on KXCF in Marshall, California, and KWTF out of Bodega Bay, California. The Final Straw is brought to you by the worker owners at Firestorm Books and Cafe at 48 Carmen Street in downtown Asheville, North Carolina. Firestorm features organic coffee and milks, vegan sandwiches, homemade baked goods, radical literature, and a community calendar that can be found online at www.firestormcafe.com. This show will stream at ashevillefm.org slash the hyphen final hyphen straw through July 28th. Past interview archives of The Final Straw can be found at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. And musical archives as well as interviews can be found at archive.org by searching the terms Asheville FM Final Straw. Sign up for a podcast at radioforall.net. For any comment, critique, criticism, or concern, drop us a line at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net. We're speaking with one of the editors of the new Nihilist Anarchist Journal from Little Black Cart, entitled Attentat. We'll be speaking about Nihilist Anarchism in order to help familiarize audiences with some of the ideas held in the pages of Attentat. Thanks so much for joining us. No problem. Well, Little Black Cart is the uh, distributor. Uh The publisher is actually called Pistols Drawn, and you can reach the Pistols Drawn website at pistolsdrawn.org. Thanks for the correction. Um, first off, can you tell a little history about the term nihilism? When was it first applied? By whom and to whom? Most people, what they know about nihilism is constrained to the Big Lebowski and to a sort of uh, comic, stylistic, whatever, popular culture reference. The history of nihilism is the history of Russian nihilism, uh, 1860s. This was a, basically a bohemian movement that came out of the university in the uh, Russian czarist context. So a very impoverished, not Western, or, or just in the beginning of Westernization. Um, so while it was urban, it was primarily students. It was also in you know, what is considered, in hindsight, to be a very backwards uh, sort of scene uh, compared to the rest of Europe. So uh, Russia at that time didn't really have an introduction to liberal Western European ideas around just just liberal philosophy, right? It hadn't been in exactly. Place. They were living under a czar, which was basically a Caesar. It was a religious authority. To put it one level further, you know, just 30 years prior, a group of soldiers who fought against Napoleon came back attempting to bring some of those values to uh, the Russian context. They were killed and they are called the Decemberists. And that group of, and the only reason we know that name is because of the band. (laughs) There's some writing that's specifically about this, but but that's fairly short. But what's interesting about the Nihilists is that that in today's language, it was somewhat of a youth culture that had uh, countercultural elements like types of dress, types of diet, types, forms of life, as in living communally, and um, and the assassination politics that came out of the people's will and came out of the Russian nihilist space. Eventually, they did kill the czar, Nicholas II. That sensibility came out of this sort of countercultural space, which obviously was unusual, as in didn't exist prior in Russia. Um, and just, just to clarify... Uh, Narodnaya Volya is the people's will. And so when you said people's will, it wasn't that the idea was coming out from actually the masses of people in Russia. It was the cleverly propagandistic name of, of that group, right? Yep. What's in a name? Talk about current perceptions of the term nihilism and what y'all feel to be the importance of its continued use. Well, I think that for us, the the term itself is not important. Similar to the term anarchism, you know, where we kind of are willing to wave our hand and describe an anarchist as anybody who uh, is willing to use the word themselves, even though this includes uh, people who who generously could be called, you know, social democrats or liberals or, you know, kind of asocial mutants. You know, since all of these people fall under the, uh, the banner of, of anarchism, the banner of nihilism has a sort of similar sort of arc. You know, there's tons of uh, self-described nihilists who I personally don't identify with at all, at all, who, you know, find their um, cultural points to be Nazism and goth music, and it's, you know, primarily an aesthetic form. What, what we're trying to, to do is, is essentially 
ask a question that we feel like was asked in the 1860s, but perhaps is a much more modern question, and and perhaps was also you know one evoked by by Nietzsche, which is that if the end of all big values is upon us, if we really are living in in a, in a sort of time where uh, the illusions of the 19th century are de- are being demonstrated clearly to us, what does that leave those who would like to change everything or, or who have a, a deep desire for the transformation of, of the world into a, into a more interesting form. Um, so in other words, the uh, nihilism in this, in this context evokes the spirit of the 1860s rather than the, than the facts on the ground. The reason why discussing an attentat, which is another way to, to talk about propaganda by the deed, uh, which of course was what anarchists and nihilists did in the in the mid to late nineteenth century. Um, for us, the conversation begins with essentially this sort of act, and the fact that this act doesn't have the sort of like causal relationship that it had in the nineteenth century to a transformation of society, but instead stands on its own. So that's what nihilism is, in at least in the in the context of Anta. It's this act that stands on its own. So the, the, the term nihilism in its active sense evokes the idea of propaganda by the deed in the form of bombings and assassinations. Um, what, what else can, I mean, that's to the, to the popular imagination, at least, or to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What else can Attentat be besides that sort of display of reactive force or, or you know, uh, productive force, I guess? Well, you know, again, we, I, I think it's important to, to talk through the fact that, you know, 150 years has, has gone on since the assassination of a czar. And, and if we can learn anything from that time, it's that, by and large, what we call propaganda by the deed didn't, uh, didn't succeed kind of on either end. In other words, the propaganda didn't really illuminate people as to what the, uh, the, the ideas were behind the propaganda or be, behind the, the activity. And the deeds didn't actually accomplish, you know, what they set to accomplish. So, in other words, in the case of the assassination of the the czar, you know, the liberal political reforms that the czar had had recently uh, enacted more or less were rolled back, and more importantly, all political radicals were suppressed for decades. Rather than kind of talking about some sort of like day in the past and how could we how could we hope to achieve the same level uh, of impact that they had then. I think that instead, the conversation, which hopefully this is a conversation rather than just a statement of purpose, the conversation would look like, what what was it that our possible friends from 150 years ago were attempting to articulate or attempting to understand and, and what aspects of those things have we essentially ignored? for this 150 years because we, like like everyone else, are wrapped up in the sensationalism of them. So specifically in this case, we're talking about the um, uh, this idea, sure, of doing outrageous things, but to put it more simply, what, what would it look like to not live a, a, a life dictated by moral authority? So not, not allowing those moral authorities to dictate the shape of the actions, but determ- determining what actions are most useful and strategic at the moment? Uh, actually, so I guess this is a, you know, again, I I hate to belabor the, the, this is in a sort of tortured philosophical way, but the political link that's made between ideas and action, by and large, we challenge, we, we challenge that link. In other words, we don't believe that the the project of a of a person who desires a, you know something something different in the world is to come up with a good idea and then figure out how to put that into practice. By and large, I think that the that's that's the um, I guess the nihilist challenge. In other words, so at least in our case, where we're beginning is with a is with an assertion, specifically that. A nihilist perspective is one that is hostile to revolution. And revolution is a code word that, you know, could also be said as, um, could also be stated as salvation. Uh, uh, We're hostile to the idea that through some process or 
through through some act uh, set of activities that the world is going to be transformed from one that's horrible and one where we suffer into one that is uh, utopic, ideal, perfect, wonderful, etc. So the concern is rather different than, than a lot of anarchist self-identified anarchist groupings that focus a lot of their energy on on <clears throat> either a practice or a theory that they believe is going to result in a total transformation of the world. So to put it simply, when unfettered from the sort of moral clause of revolutionary thinking, a nihilist perspective would be one that, that is free to, to consider a different activity. In the case of uh, spirited attacks against the existing order, that existing activity, one doesn't have a sort of procedural endgame, and two, does not have to be answerable to the, to the essentially thinking of the left of the 20th century. So in other words, not only does it not have to accept the premise of nonviolence, but also doesn't have to accept premises that have come uh, more recently, for instance, in the Earth First space, that basically says that we shouldn't even take a risk of doing an activity that could hurt a human being. All of that, that was a myth. The myth that good ideas then meant good actions, basically that's bullish. So then what? what? How do we determine how to act? If we, don't, if we don't make a model in our heads of how the world operates and what sort of activities can, can result in certain um, outcomes, where, where does the nihilist act from? Or what, how do they determine what kind of actions to take? Well, in this context, you know, we are talking about, uh, I guess, having an anarchist ethic, which means you know, a general attitude in hostility towards the state, central authority, and economics. But, but again, the framing the question in such an operational way it is what we're trying to point to as being like what we're challenging. In other words, most people don't actually act in the, in the method that you described. Most people would just like to believe that they do and in hindsight tend towards rewriting their own personal history. In, in such in such a way that they do exactly that. So if I mean, well, you said you said what people actually do, but what what would the the nihilist do or not do? Well, I think that the the uh, the obvious places to begin would 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 be the the rejection of pre existing modes of thoughts. So nihilists do not create parties, they do not join organizations, they do not establish and enact political programs. To the extent to which they are, are concerned with or surround themselves with those sorts of activities is because nihilists tend to be very curious. In other words, the, if, the, if, the, if the premise is a deep critique of the world that is, and that involves knowing and understanding the world that, as it is and, and knowing and understanding the, uh, the practices that are around them. So it doesn't mean it necessarily, it's, it's like not forming organizations, but maybe engaging in what's going on around them and, and becoming aware and, and building a sense of maybe how the world works before action? Rigorous experimentation would be a, a rule of thumb. What does, what does nihilism, in that sense, what does it bring to anarchism and what does anarchism bring to nihilism? A simple description of the nihilist anarchist uh, perspective would be that revolution is impossible. Now that's the that's the short pithy version. The longer version of the with the same intent would be that the definition of revolution has this sort of two hundred year two hundred plus year history, uh, beginning with the French Revolution and kind of ending with the fall of the Berlin Wall. So that's sort of like, uh, from my perspective, central understanding of of what nihilism is, informs anarchism and vice versa. Okay, so. The idea of revolution as envisioned in this over 200-year-old viewpoint is that, and as anarchists have adopted it as modern anarchists are sort of the children of Rousseau and the children of the French Revolution, is this idea of a glorious event in which the masses of people become aware, are able to overthrow the existing power structure and fill the vacuum and from an anarchist perspective, abolish the the need for revolution because it, it, it means the building of structures that are in whatever vision anarchist, well, whatever sort of anarchist vision it is like they're utopic. Like, so is, would you say that the nihilist anarchist tendency considers utopia to be an enemy? 
Yes. That, that utopic thinking uh, is not only impossible, but it's, it's impossible in such a way that it is not desirable rather than impossible and desirable, which, is, which tends to be the anarchist approach. And how does, how does the idea of utopia and the nihilist anarchist critique of utopia tie in with the nihilist anarchist critique of Christianity or religious world viewpoints? Yeah, uh, obviously they're, they're you know, more or less the same. The, you can get a lot more specific when you talk about uh, religion because you know, the religious types tend to have a more uh, specific vision. You know, utopia has kind of died on the cross of postmodernism, I guess, whereas you know, religions are, are stronger than ever. In this way, um, many nihilists would share an awful lot in common with the most scientific of, of anarchist perspectives that say that there's no room for spirituality at all. Within the range of a nihilist perspective, though, there, I, I think, is a, a strong overlap between a Buddhist perspective and a nihilist perspective. How so? I'm uncomfortable speaking on behalf of Buddhism, but the approach of being as, as the way of being in the world uh, is totally a simpatico with a nihilist perspective. We're speaking with an editor of the Nihilist Anarchist Journal entitled Attentat, recently published by Pistols Drawn and available from Little Black Cart. More after this musical break.
We're speaking with an editor of the Nihilist Anarchist Journal entitled Attentat. There was something that you said before uh, during a previous conversation that we had where you were comparing nihilism and atheism. So an atheist anarchist and a nihilist during this discussion. Can you can you do that again? That was good. Uh, when I was younger, I was exposed to atheists, and they have these sort of, you know, pithy responses to a to a variety of kind of common arguments. And uh, so, one of their pithy responses is, you know, arguing with a Buddhist. You know, hello, Buddhist. You don't believe in Jesus as the, you know, son of God. And the Buddhist would say, of course I don't. You don't believe in Thor as the, you know, as a god. No, of course I don't. You don't believe in Allah as a, as a God? No, no. And so the atheist would say, I don't believe in just as many gods as you don't of the thousands of gods that are out there, plus one. Our perspectives are totally in alignment with, you know, with a, with a less than 1% difference. And um, so similarly, uh, Nihilist perspective, to the extent to which it's a, you know, operating in a, in a, in a field of, of politics, would would say to an anarchist that I agree with you, anarchist. You know, I don't want communism. I don't want socialism. I don't want social democracy. I don't want a you know daddy state, mommy state. I don't want all the same things that you don't. Except in addition, I don't want self management by you know workers' councils. In addition, I don't want the communal operation of you know mass factories or. In addition, I don't want consensus-based meetings. In addition, I don't want study groups and affinity groups to be ruling the land. What is your nihilist anarchist position on the concept of hope? I think that the the problem with this with nihilism as an extreme political position, which is not exactly how I would describe it, and one of the reasons why I wouldn't necessarily use it as a word that I'd like, you know, would hand a pamphlet to a stranger and say, become a nihilist. Essentially, I, w- I would just kind of say that the, the time for this sort of like, for fighting over labels or fighting over flags is, it's not, it's not that it's over, because obviously there's plenty of people still doing it, but it just, the, the returns have become quite diminished. And I think everybody accepts that. I would strongly recommend people check out the uh, documentary filmmaker Adam Curtis. In a variety of his series, he, he more or less implies that the political optimism is over. In other words, that people don't fight for flags anymore, that, that, they, that they instead you know, rely on our political actors just to defend themselves against horrible monsters that the political actors devote most of their energy to, to using as boogeymen. And so with that in mind, I don't think that, that declaring yourself against hope is controversial, except amongst kind of the revolutionary left. Uh, I think pretty much everybody else is on the same page in that they just don't accept hope as like part of their vocabulary um, outside of outside of religious hope. And you know, the reason that people still rely on religious hope is because these people have been working on their message for you know thousands of years. They're quite good at it. And so to declare nihilism as against hope is a tautology, of course. So coming back to Nietzsche, um, the journal points to him as developing the idea, or at least yeah, points to him as being the source of, of this idea that there are two main strains of nihilist positions, the wedge and the critique. Can you talk about the difference between these two? Are they the same as active and passive nihilism? I'm not going to use that vocabulary, but I think that there's both this construction that we live in a world that can be described as nihilistic, and this is definitely what what, what Nietzsche is general sense of it was, use of the term. In other words, that that the value system of the Western Enlightenment is cor- corrupting and devaluing itself from, from within, and as a result, what we are experiencing in the world that we live in is a devaluation of, of the claims of you know, it's always easy to use the priest as the example, but but in the in the in this era of the devaluation of all, all values, that nihilism is is how to describe that phenomenon. I'm not sure I would use that word because I, I just don't. Whatever I prefer a different de- uh, definition to that term, which is something a bit more active. So this is, goes to the active and the, and the passive. So for me, I would refer to that as like a the ennui of of these of these value systems. In other words, like to the extent to which 
global post enlightenment capitalism has dominated the globe, it has um, it's declared the winners and losers. And so, for most, you know, ninety plus percent of humanity, what's there left to do but resign oneself to just living? How depressing. Yeah, quite depressing. <laughs> so obviously, in the in the context of an active nihilism, you know, this is an idea that that we as individual actors, we as as some sort of alter, uh, do have uh, still room to to experiment vividly. I'd like to hear about active nihilist anarchist currents for a moment. Spectacular attacks and trials have made headlines in Mexico with individuals tending towards the wild. In Chile, Indonesia, Greece, Italy, and elsewhere with Conspiracy Cells of Fire and the Informal Anarchist Federation. These sorts of groups don't appear in the United States or Canada as far as I'm aware. Can you talk about these groups really briefly and why, in your opinion, um, you think the American milieu hasn't seen their likes? Well, I think the, the simple answer is that there is no discontinuity in the rest of the world between uh, an active communist set of communist parties or not capitalist institutions and today. In other words, in the U.S., the 20th century was was a clean break between a sort of socialist possibility and and what we have now. And for most of the rest of the world, there 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 were active oppositions to the expansion of global capitalism. And so that means that many of the children of the, you know, the children of the communists are, are the members of the CCF today. Because of the direction that, that most non-post-left, even, even some post-left, I guess, tendencies within anarchism, they are not reacting in, to the experience and the history of being repressed by a communist party even though that's that's in our like collective anarchist memory from world experiences and, and from the last century of, of history. There might be a slight uh, misunderstanding as to what I was saying. When I'm referring to the Communist Party is in this context, I'm actually referring to them positively because the communists were active, vivid, spectacular opposition to capitalism. In other words, and, and I say this because I was, I was in Greece a few years ago, the the children of members of communism who th- overthrew fascism and and were seen as an effective uh, agent of political operation in the Greek context, their children are the people who today are in the CCF. In other words, they learned politics on the knee of people who were in true contestation with, with you know, global expansion of capitalism. As opposed to the United States, where basically almost none of us have in our history any sort of any sort of memory of of opposition to this existing order. And that's interesting. So this is why the Americas we we come off as so incredibly counterculture because for us anarchism has no other history other than coming out of the punk rock uh, experience. It hasn't really been a threat since since nineteen seventeen nineteen twenty. The thing I, I want to be really careful about, and, th- and this is a, a general uh, concern I have, is that a lot of times Americans blame us for this happening. In other words, like, like we're to fault because we all look like punk rockers or hipsters. But what I'm saying is that the, the fault of the, of the situation, you know, yeah, sure, it goes to 1917. It goes to even earlier or to, or to later based on, you know, how you, how you do your measuring. But the, the point is, is that... Um, uh, we just didn't have good mentors. We, we have so we have very few people giving us good information about how to fight the existing order. And you know the examples that we have, you know, they come as they're as likely to have come out of a Quaker tradition as a people of color tradition. Neither of which have had a particularly great success as, uh, uh, at slowing capitalism. Whereas you know, criticize Marxists and communists as obviously I'm one of the first to do, but they, 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 they had some victories. We're speaking with an editor of the Nihilist Anarchist Journal entitled Ottentat, recently published by Pistols Drawn and available from Little Black Cart. More after this musical break. God save the queen, a fascist regime, 
made you a moron, a potential age bomb. God save the queen, she ain't a human being. There is no future in England's dreaming. Don't be told what you want. Don't be told what you need. There is no future. There is no future. There is no future for you. God save the queen. We mean it, man. We love our queen. God. Tourist on money and a figure head is not what she seems. When there's no future, how can there be seen? Where the flowers in the dust been? Where the poison in your human machine? Where the future, your future? God save history. Save your mate parade. Oh Lord God have mercy, cause all crimes are paid. No future, no, no, no future, no, no future for me. We are speaking with an editor of the Nihilist Anarchist Journal entitled Attentat. Pistols Drawn, which published Attentat, recently re-released two essays from about five years ago into a compilation called Boom. In the essay, Consequences, the author detailed three overlapping elements of evaluating a nihilist program, critique as practice, evocation of the deed, and negation. Um, can you give a fictional example of a nihilist program and apply these evaluations? In five seconds, with your eyes covered and hands behind her <laughs> go yeah I'm, you see the problem with with using a word like nihilism and one of the reasons why just in some of our in some of my more recent thinking i'm using the word less and less is because as soon as you use an ism not only do you fall prey to the situationist critique of ideology which is fair you also uh, there is an assumed construction, which the construction looks like. What is your critique of society? Describe the tools that you use to make the critique and that you're now going to do, use in step three, which is then to offer solutions. Within the post-left imagination, there's a sense that critique is the most important thing that a post-left anarchist can do. Within Ottentat, there's actually a piece that's kind of in direct response to a former place or, or, or to that as approach. It's called uh, critique critique. The problem that I have with that, with that approach is that critique, on the one hand, is a straight Marxist slash Hegelian construction that has a sort of, that has a particular sort of modeled form, right? Assertion, counter-assertion, and then resolution. You know, this is a, a dialectical sort of um, construction yeah and and what i was trying to get at was uh, how can we how can we think outside of dialectics now i'm not a philosopher and i, I don't have a, a particular philosophical background and so to some extent you can you can describe a process by which you interrogate and and synthesize as as being a uh, an appropriate and pleasant thing, and, I, and I'm, I'm not trying to curtail that. But what I am definitely trying to curtail is this sort of classic Marxist approach that, to put it bluntly, believes in truth and believes in the truth of this process called dialectics. In other words, if dialectics is a, des is a descriptive term to, to talk about a process, and if critique is, you know, if our critique is casual, I, I don't have a problem with it. But it, not just when our critique becomes formal, but when our 
critique becomes a, a truth exercise, I have a great problem with it. So from a nihilist perspective, you know, originally what I was trying to get at with this was the sort of uh, a rigorous, informal critique that was was what, what I was aiming for. What, Just sort of play, playing with it, right? Well, a little mental that, parkour. Yeah, I, I think that's that's a yeah, that's a nice that's a nice uh, point of view on it. I think that the problem here is that how do you how do, does one avoid taking oneself too seriously while also taking quite seriously the sort of uh, existential morass that we're in and and that's you know the, that's the that's the game that's the kind of parkour that that nihilism is playing with and so this is why devoting too much energy towards um having answers to sort of pat political questions is 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 kind of ignoring the fact that we don't give enough about pat political uh questions that's the perspective of critique as critique yeah basically I think it's I think it's put somewhere else, but um, relativism with bruises is uh, <laughs> one of the pet phrases that we use. Alejandro de Acosta contributed to a very interesting piece, or contributed a very interesting piece um, of writing to the new edition of Anarchy: A Journal of Desire Armed, concerning his reading of After Post Anarchism by Dwayne Russell. Uh, this essay posits that at that nihilist ethics are a central theme to what actually makes anarchism a tendency willing to question assumptions and develop with time and experience. Can you explain or can you talk about that viewpoint and the importance of tangling with moral assumptions often present in more mainstream anarchisms as we've seen? So the word nihilist is not the important part of this. The important part of this conversation is the, the nature of anarchists in this era to become pluralists. And uh, so, in other words, to say that two approaches to a to a moral or ethical problem are equally good, and and so as a result, and and, the, and you know, in the sort of within the internet context, this is this is oftentimes described as being liberal. In Duane's book, he I think rightly accuses the post anarchists. Of being pluralists in their in their ethical understanding of of anarchist perspective, perspectives. I, I'm trying to think of a good example, and I really um, I think the diversity of tactics within the within the context of the anti globe movement is a classic example of of pluralism at work. In other words, it says that you know we all share the project of wanting to stop this this quasi government meeting. So we're going to do it in the variety of different approaches that we feel affinity towards, and we're going to try to not accuse others or snitch out others or hurt. We're going to respect the boundaries of other people's uh, different uh, different approaches to, to to the same sort of activity. So that would be the pluralist approach, and obviously it's it's played itself out for you know almost 15 years of different discussions and, and limitations as, as to whether or not pluralism can work within within the anti-globe movement, but also within sort of anarchist thinking in general. But it's pretty clear that most of the big names in anarchist thinking and writing and opinion all agree with this perspective. In other words, they essentially, they think that this diversity of tactics is an anarchist approach to problem solving. So this nihilist approach is in contradiction to this. It disagrees with this. The extent to which it disagrees, I think, can be a very challenging conversation because I don't want to put words in other people's mouths. But I think that that where I'd begin would be to say that CCF and the activity of CCF is or is an example of this lack of moral center, this pluralist moral moral center. But I think what Alejandro is explaining. Is it was exploring, which was also what Duane was exploring, is what does that kind of look like from a from a moralistic perspective or from a moral like in moral language, and specifically, or to, to state it simply, even though this obviously can can be unpacked, is that there's there's nothing there. In other words, you know, for starters, a nihilist would question whether or not engaging in the anti globalization movement is an appropriate use of resources or energy. But even assuming that they that they were to participate in such activities, that 
that they would not agree with the sort of essential liberal assumption that everybody's perspective is equal and that everybody's value is the same. Just, I know it's, it's pretty simple in the language of it, but can you break down the difference between what, what social and antisocial actions are? You mean like antisocial being attack or just non -jo not, not joining in and, and working with a group that's running off consensus? I mean, consensus would be the, 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 the model of the, of the social anarchist perspective. Like, in other words, that you basically don't act until you get the consent of all of the actors. And um, so I think that that's a pretty good rule of thumb. That's, that's what, that's the, that's the answer to that, to that question. The antisocial actor or the, or an antisocial action is one that is, uh, that just doesn't involve that. It, it comes from a different set of motivations. And, and right here in this question is, does lie the, the tension between a nihilist perspective and a, and a more broad or more liberal anarchist perspective. Because clearly, for a lot of anarchists, they believe that anarchism is a beautiful perspective, a beautiful political perspective, because it's the most good. And for most anarchists, an essential core of their anarchist belief is the fact that humans are capable of good, and that, uh, and that the essential character of people is some, some sort of goodness. And because nihilists don't share that perspective, it means that uh, getting the consent of people who are not necessarily good isn't particularly important to them. I guess the maybe the, the, the better approach to taking the questions would be, you know, who do we critique or, or who, do, who do we find that it's important to draw distinctions between mm -hmm. and why? And so um, the most obvious anarchist pluralist position uh, is best represented by the sort of new anarchisms of post-anarchism and also of groups like the Institute for Anarchist Studies and perhaps uh, even groups like Crime Think, where, where rather than, than staking out a, a, a position, rather than a position being a relationship between theory and practice, from, from my perspective, I'd say that that a position is, is a practice in search of a theory and a theory in search of a practice r rather than a sort of a seamless orb-like construction. Putting that to the side, the plur pluralist position basically is a um, diversity of tactics in all things. So it, it implies that, you know, if we just do more good, that the result will be good. Which seems in a way to tie into what the journal said about insurrectional anarchism or what, what idea it played with. There was a discussion in a, in a couple of the articles criticizing uh, Alfredo Bonanno, the Italian insurrectionalist's uh, writings and ideas and what the U.S. milieu may have taken from that, coming from a more of punk rock DIY background that, you know, if in, in light of the idea that we don't think that we want to or can or it may not be in our interest to organize a mass of people for an organized leftist revolution um, that the American insurrectional milieu takes the position that any activity is good activity well I, I am I that, am I mixing metaphors no I, I, I think that that's that's good in the, in the in the sense that that it's important that we are we are actually attempting to draw distinctions between this sort of nihilist pos uh, position and other positions, of which a pluralist, pluralist position is, is an example of one, one that most likely looks more like sort of old leftist positions. The insurrectionary position, as critiqued in the piece and in that Bonanno article, um, has a little bit more to do with the particular historicity of uh, Bonanno. Uh, I think the American critique is actually you know, can be a lot sloppier because Americans are a lot sloppier in how in how they've embraced Bonanoism. But yeah, yeah, obviously that's one of the goals of the journal is to um, is to kind of poke at that particular distinction. So I think that that where where we could do some exploring is just to say why is it that the American insurrectionary perspective is different than Bonanoism? Is it really like this in Europe? Where? How? You know, these are all big interesting questions but for us because Atentat you know comes out of the US context we're we're drawing distinctions between actors here one thing much repeated in the writings of Monsieur Dupont 
uh, two writers in the UK espousing nihilist communism is the idea of doing nothing. When one understands nothing useful can be done, consequences, as a part of the compilation boom, ends up on a comparable sort of note calling for patience. Can you talk about the strategic purpose of waiting and assessing? Also, uh, De Boer mentions this point in Society of the Spectacle. So we do we do have a, a tradition that we're that we're coming out of. I think that the maybe this is because we're Americans, <laughs> whatever that means. Um, I I I do think that we have a, a sort of urge to to impact the outside world, and so within the context of patience, definitely I think that 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 was attempting to evoke De Boer's sort of. Kriegspielian strategic sort of uh, evaluation, and obviously the uh, strategy and thinking about what strategy means is is not outside the scope of what's done in Attentat. And so the idea of quote unquote revolutionary patience, which is to understand when the moment to act would be, I, I just think that it's it's all stated there, and it's I think fairly self evident. I think that the the difference between this and a sort of militant pose would be essentially about, uh, would be a question about levels of patience. So, you know, I think that a militant would have been, by and large, is, is hungry for anything to happen, for any news or, uh, headline to fly by and take that advantage to, quote-unquote, go to the streets. And the hope would be that uh, an approach that looks like patience would, would attempt to um, understand what's happening in the streets and to understand who is acting within the context of... Whatever, whether it's street activity or, or or something else, but but would would attempt to understand the the people who are actually alive and on the ground rather than just be involved. <laughs> the um, Duponts, though, I think are a, a lot more uh, pointed in their in their perspective, meaning that for them, I think the discussion is enough. Like I think that they're they're pretty clear that. You know, the direction that at least the most active of the DuPonts went in was 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 purely towards uh, literature. Literature is wonderful, but it's it qualifies as doing nothing a lot more than talking about Occupy, which is obviously an, an overt political moment. I very much enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much for joining. Take it easy. We've been speaking with an editor of the Nihilist Anarchist Journal entitled Attentat recently published by Pistols Drawn and available from A Little Black Cart. Check out the website for that project at pistolsdrawn.org.
Mostly Media, AshevilleFM.org. This is The Final Straw, and I'm Burst of Goodness. The show can also be heard on KXCF in Marshall, California, and KWTF out of Bodega Bay, California. The Final Straw is brought to you by the worker owners at Firestorm Books and Cafe at 48 Karma Street in downtown Asheville, North Carolina. Firestorm features organic coffee and milks, vegan sandwiches, homemade baked goods, radical literature, and a community calendar that can be found online at www.firestormcafe.com. This show will stream at ashevillefm.org slash the hyphen final hyphen straw through July 28th. Past interview archives of The Final Straw can be found at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. And musical archives as well as interviews can be found at archive.org by searching the terms Asheville FM Final Straw. Sign up for a podcast at radioforall.net. For any comment, critique, criticism, or concern, drop us a line at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net. Have a great week.